So um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs uh, has a uh, interesting article this week, an interesting essay about leadership and loyalty. And of course, the person who he's mainly talking about is Bilam. Bilam is the individual in the parsha who is meant to be able to curse. He's meant to know how to curse people and his curses come true. And so Balak hires Bilam in order to curse the Jewish people. And uh, Bilam had experience in cursing. He, they, he's pr proved himself successful in previous wars. Uh, we are um, Sichon conquered land from Moab and it was all because of Bilam. So they decided that they should ask Bilam and hire him to curse the Jewish people. Now, what did Bilam, how did Bilam know how to curse people? What was his trick? So what was, what was a special, what, what the special thing that Bilam had, the Gemara says, is that he knew the exact moment that God gets angry. We actually learned this in the Gemara, those that come to the morning class, that right. there is a moment every day that Hashem gets angry. Kirega biyapu. There is a moment of anger. And that moment that Hashem is angry is not a good, it's not a moment where you want to curse anyone. But the thing is, it's only for one split second. And no one knows when that moment is except for Bilam. Bilam knew the moment that God gets angry. And he was able to use that knowledge to be able to destroy and, and curse people by uh, cursing them exactly at that moment. We actually learned in the Gemara what that means. How could he have cursed them in a split second? In order to say a curse, it takes time. And so how is he gonna curse them in a, in a split second? So we, we had a few explanations. Mm -hmm. One of them was that he was gonna say one word Kalem, destroy them. That's all he needed to do. Say one word, Kalem. And that would have been good enough. He wasn't going to give a long speech in his curse. He was going to say one word. Or the other explanation is that as long as he starts the curse exactly when God gets angry, that would, the, the, the anger of Hashem would somehow be able to, he would be able to extend it, so to speak, into the full the full paragraph of his curse, the full sentence that he says, as long as he starts at the right moment. However, you learn, basically, Bilam had that ability to curse to curse people, and uh, he was hired at this point to curse the Jewish people. And um, miraculously, he wasn't able to curse them. And on that, the, 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 under, the explanation is, that in those moments, that those, excuse me, those days that he was hired to curse the Jewish people, it says Hashem didn't even get angry one moment. In those days that he was hired to curse the Jewish people, Hashem, even for that moment, he didn't, he didn't get angry. And therefore, Bilaam had to, was not, unable to actually curse the Jewish people. Not only was he unable to curse them, but Hashem put words of blessing in his mouth and he ended up blessing the Jewish people. Some of the greatest blessings uh, come from none other than Bilam. Yeah, so it was very, very uh, interesting to note that you would think, you know, the greatest blessings would come from, uh, you know, from, from Moses, from Avraham. And uh, uh, yet the, uh, the greatest blessings um, um, uh, come from 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 Bilam. And in fact, blessings about about Mashiach, about the, the, the final uh, ultimate goal of the whole world uh, are uttered in this week's Parsha from, from Bilam himself. Now, uh, um, uh, Rebbe, there's a, yes. I wanted to say, it seems that God gives us a lot more time for good things than for a curse. 
It gives you a well, lot more sure. than a, <laughs> a, a split than second. A, yeah, second. everything, yeah. everything is good, and there's only a split second of negative, right? So th there's a, a place where the Rebbe mentions. He says, "Our greatest blessings were uttered not by Moses, not by David, not even by God Himself. They were uttered by the wicked sorcerer hired to curse." And on this, the Rebbe says, "The most brilliant diamonds." hide in the deepest bowels of the earth, the most intense blessings in the darkest caverns of life. And so here we have great blessings that Hashem forced Bilam to give the Jewish people. And of course, Balak was very angry when Bilam started blessing the Jewish people, but he had no choice. It was too late. Bilam uttered those words of blessing. Yes, Yehuda. I, I thought Hashem doesn't get angry. So it, we, we say in the davening that ki rega biyapri, it's, it's part of Tehillim, but we say it in davening, ki rega biyapri chayim b'rtsoinoi b'erev yolin bechi v'laboyke rino. So it, it, it's in chapter 30 of the uh, uh, Tehillim. So there, there, there is a moment every day that Hashem gets angry, except Hashem didn't get angry at all during those days that Bilam uh, was supposed to curse uh, the Jewish people. But there is... Now, what does that mean? Does Hashem get angry? That's a good question that Yehuda is asking. Does, is, is it possible? Is, is it, is, I mean, it does say, V'chara af Hashem. Uh, Hashem gets angry. We say it in the, in the Shema. But at the same time, how could you say that there's anger by Hashem? But I'll leave that to the uh, teachers of uh, Meirin Nevochim and the, those that want to teach philosophy, uh, to deal with the hard questions like that. Um, but we, we, you know what I mean? That's, it's really beyond the scope of, uh, uh, you know, our, uh, our class, but, uh, in any event, um, it, it you know, we'll, we'll base it on the Psukim and on the Psukim it does in the Gemara. The Gemara says that there is some type of thing of anger, at least for a split second, whatever that means. And, uh, and, uh, Bilam used to take advantage of that. So, uh, Excuse me. yes, yeah, doesn't, doesn't, uh, isn't it said that a split second for God is a long time for us? Well, no one seems to answer that, no one seems to explain the, that, uh, you know, that, 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 uh, that's the meaning of the verse. So, it seems like, um, it's a moment for us that Hashem gets angry. That's, oh, okay. that's what the understanding is. So uh, Rabbi Sachs uh, begins the, the, his, his essay about leadership. And does leadership require someone to have a, a moral um, uh, traits as well? And um, is it just the ability to command and to have show power? Or does it have an essentially moral dimension. Can a bad person be a good leader? Or will their badness, will it compromise their leadership? This is, these are his questions. And this is what the Parsha uh, in Rabbi Sachs's uh, eyes is really telling us. Um, because this is what Bilam was all about. So he starts off saying that there was an archaeological discovery in 1967 and they found where the Jordan and the Jabbok rivers uh, 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 joined together, they, they found an inscription on a wall of a pagan temple dated, the inscription was dated to the 8th century before the Common Era and it makes reference to a seer named Bilam ben Ba'ar. And uh, he says that's a, uh, a great discovery. And uh, Bilam was obviously a well-known figure in the region. Now, the truth is, we do know stories about Bilam. Bilam was the one who encouraged Pharaoh to get rid of the Jewish people in, 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 in Egypt. So Bilam does, uh, you know, he, 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 he has a history of 
uh, hating the Jewish people and wanting to destroy us. And um, uh, so th there are previous stories. There's a story that uh, Bilam, Jethro, and Eov, Job, they were all advisors to Pharaoh. And uh, um, Jethro, he, um, he, he spoke against uh, doing anything. He, he, he protested to Pharaoh's idea to, 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 to make decrees against the Jewish people. And he had to run away. Uh, Job was quiet. And therefore, he got punished with all the different uh, sufferings that we read about in the book of Job. And uh, Bilam, uh, Pharaoh seemed to accept his, uh, his, his uh, advice, and uh, Pharaoh made uh, decrees against the Jewish people. So Bilam does have a history of hating the Jewish people, and uh, he obviously was a popular guy to be the, the uh, advisor, to be an advisor of, of Pharaoh. But uh, Rabbi Sachs doesn't bring that, but he mentions that he obviously was a very popular figure in the region, and he mentions that his skills were very impressive. Uh, a miracle worker, and uh, uh, he was quite sought after. Um, I know, Bullock says, I know that whoever you bless is blessed, and whoever you curse is cursed. And that's, that's not like part, it's not like something that we question. We know that that's true. He had special abilities. And um, it says in uh, the book of Devarim that no prophet has risen in Israel like Moshe, like Moses, who knew whom the Hashem knew face to face. And so the rabbis interpret that verse that in Israel, among the Jewish people, there was no one as great as Moses. But among the nations, there was someone as great as Moses, and that was Bilam. And uh, what that means is that the nations of the world were going to complain if God didn't give them a great leader, they would have complained and said, it's not right, it's not fair that the Jewish people had great leaders and we didn't. And so you can't, you can't uh, deny us of the uh, rewards and you can't say that we don't deserve special reward. We never, we were never given a chance. We didn't. We never had great leaders. And so Hashem says, "I'm going to give them a great. I'll give them a great leader." And He gave them Billa. And so that Billa, that's why Billam had to be in the same league, so to speak, as Moses, at least from the level of impurity on the on the opposite side. But he was very, very capable and the potential to be to be extremely great. And, uh, and um, uh, of course, righteous, and he could, he could have been uh, powerful in, in, the, in the spiritual realm. But, of course, he, he used it all for negative purposes. He, he took all of his powers, and he used them in a negative way. And so Bilam was, in a certain sense, as great as Moses and uh, there is another Midrashic source that says that there was nothing in the world that Hashem did not reveal to Bilam, who surpassed Moses in the wisdom of sorcery. So there is, uh, there are sources that Bilam had had great knowledge in uh, in uh, areas of you know, black magic, sorcery, that type of stuff. And, um, and he, he, you know, even more than Moses had now had, so, had more knowledge than Moses. And what this all means is that Bilam had great talent. And, and, and we, we don't deny that. We don't uh, claim that it's not true. He did. He had great, great talent. Yet, The ultimate verdict on Bilam is negative. And uh, we read about how he tried to curse them. He ended up giving them blessings. And uh, 
ultimately, did Bilam hurt the Jewish people or not? Anyone? Does anyone know? Because he tried to curse us, but he couldn't. He, he, he only said words of blessing. So did he end up hurting? Uh, the Jewish yeah, by, Rabbi. Yes? Didn't he, he preach uh, immorality to the, uh, you know, try to get them to be sexually sexually immoral? and That's right. To, so after, and, that's correct. Thank you, Moshe. After Bilam was unsuccessful at cursing the Jewish people, he... Uh, he, he came up with a alternative method to destroy the Jewish people. And that method, unfortunately, worked. And what was that method? He couldn't curse them because God didn't let him. But he found an alternative method. And the alternative method to hurt the Jewish people is that if you try to hurt them and God doesn't want, it's not going to work. But if you get the Jewish people to sin, then God, their God will, 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 he himself will, 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 will punish them. So you don't, you, you, as long as you get them to sin, then you'll succeed in hurting them. Not because you're going to be successful in, in, in fighting them, because God will send some type of plague, you know, some, some type of punishment to them. So Bilam advised, the Moabites and the Midianites to go and and uh, offer their daughters to entice the Jewish men and get them to sin. And by doing that, it brought about terrible sin on the Jewish people. And ultimately, many thousands of Jewish people died because of this terrible sin that the Jewish people were set up. We were framed. And uh, we were um, tricked into, and uh, we we ended up sinning. At least met many many of the there were many many thousands of Jewish people died because of this sin, and so Bilam ultimately did succeed not at cursing the Jewish people, but he did succeed in causing punishment to come upon the Jewish people because he caused us to sin in in, in a immoral immoral ways and the. Uh, the Midrashim, they talk about how the, uh, the, the, the Jewish people were in, in, by this, by their encamped in a, cer a certain area. In the Moabites and Midianites, they opened up shops nearby uh, that they had clothing. And they encouraged, they, uh, they uh, made it like there was um, uh, an opportunity to buy clothing at decent prices. And so they ended up causing the men, the men came to look at the clothing and then they would trick the men into going into a back room where there's even a bigger selection. And so they would get them to go into the back room and in the back room, there was a, a woman who they didn't even realize, they didn't expect and she wasn't fully dressed and very enticing. And somehow she got the Jewish men to fall into the, the, the trap got them to worship uh, their their idol and eat the non-kosher and then have and then have relations with them so ultimately they got the Jewish men to sin and uh, and that's how uh, the um, Bilam succeeded in in, in, in his in, you know in his uh, second second try of hurting the Jewish people so Rabbi Sachs continues and he and he brings that The Israelites, having been saved by God from the would-be curses of Moab and Midian, suffered a self-inflicted tragedy by allowing themselves to be enticed uh, by the women of the land. And God's anger burned against them. And uh, uh, it, it emerges that uh, Bilaam, who devised, it was Bilaam who devised the strategy, tra strategy and they were... Uh, uh, they were the ones who followed Bilaam's advice and were the means of turning the Israelites away from Hashem. And this was the city that they were in was called was Pa'ar. And um, or at that place of Pa'ar where there was an idol of Pa'ar so that a plague struck the Hashem's people and having failed to curse the, uh, the Israelites, he did succeed in, in causing them great harm. So 
what comes out from here is that here you have this man with great talent, a prophet, almost like Moses or similar to Moses, compared to Moses. And at the same time, he has flawed character. He was an evildoer or caused evil. And the, 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 the in Tractate Sanhedrin, it mentions that he has no portion in the world to come. And what was the, uh, what, what does the Gemara in Tractate Sanhedrin say? So it says, if you take the name Bilam, it stands for Biloyam, a man without a people. So that's what his name symbolizes, that he's a man without, without a people. Now, what does that mean, he's a man without a people? So in the Gemara, um, the simple meaning is that he doesn't have a portion with the people. They get a portion in the world to come. And he... Uh, or he, he doesn't have a portion um, let me just take a look one second So um, the, uh, the Gemara says that he doesn't have a nation. He's Beloy Am. And She'en uh, Chelak Imam, Rashi says. He has no portion with the nation. So on the side it says he has no portion with the Jewish people. But there's other explanations here. And the Maharal says that he has no portion with any nation. And this teaches that he has no portion in the world to come. And because he's not part of any group. And um, he also mentions another explanation that uh, uh, there's a, that uh, everyone, all of his people ran away from him because he wanted to try to curse the Jewish people. And, uh, and um, when he wasn't able to, so uh, they sort of left him. So he was, he was left without, without followers. So that's one of the explanations here that he's without a nation. So Rabbi Sachs brings that to mean that he was a man without loyalties. Bilam sent, Balak sent for him, come and curse these people because they're too powerful for me, Balak said. Because I know that whoever you bless will be blessed. Whoever you curse is cursed. And Bilam was a prophet for hire. He was whoever paid him. That's what he did. And um, he had supernatural powers. He could bless someone. And it would work. And he could curse them and it would work. And... Um, He, the main point that Rabbi Sachs brings from this is that he's a loner. He has no one with him. He's got, he's, he, he's not loyal to anyone. And um, because of that, he's, he's a person that he'll do whatever, whoever pays him more. That's basically his, his rules. While Moses is the exact opposite. Bechol Beisi Naman, who it says about Moses. Moses, who in my whole house, he's fully loyal to me, God says. And uh, he, he was disappointed uh, with the Jewish people numerous times, Moses, but he never stopped fighting for them. They kept on sinning and he kept on fighting their case. He was very loyal. And if things didn't work, he spoke to God. He said, why are you mistreating this people? 
when it didn't work with, with Paroy at first. And why did you send me? He constantly was, when they sinned with the golden calf, Hashem wanted to destroy them. He asked them to forgive him, forgive the Jewish people. And if he's not going to forgive them, what did he say? Erase my name from your book. So Moshe was truly a loyal individual, while Bilam was the exact opposite. And so it's an interesting uh, understanding of, of, of the Gemara. In other words, the Gemara just says he didn't have a nation, but Rabbi Sachs takes that to mean that he, he had no loyalties. He, could, he was like a free agent. You sort of, you pay them to choose which, whichever, to, to, to take whatever side you wanted. So that's a, that's a very nice explanation. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not, I don't know if that's the simple uh, meaning over here. Uh, I don't think so. It uh, doesn't seem to be the, the, what the commentaries explain, but that's, uh, it comes out. I mean, I, I guess it fits the Maharal's explanation, but it's not like, I don't see that the Maharal was emphasizing that. The, 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 the Gemara is emphasizing that he has no portion in the world to come. But Rabbi Sachs is, is taking the fact that he's without a nation to, the, to emphasize the fact that he, he's a free agent. He has no nation that he's loyal to. He does what he wants, and he's totally free, and, um, and, and, and that is sort of a lesson that we can learn if we want to learn something about leadership. Here, here is uh, the Torah telling us something about leadership. It's telling us who Bilam was. Bilam stands for Beloyam. He's not loyal to any nation. And that's a beautiful insight. And uh, he compares him to Moses. And of course, Moses is this is the opposite. We just gave a few examples. We know even in the case of uh, Korach's rebellion, Moses prayed, um, you're going to be angry with the entire people just because of one person, one person sins. The alcohol ha'edo yiktsoif, and on the whole nation, you're going to be angry. So we have Moshe constantly uh, speaking up for the Jewish people, very loyal to the Jewish people, and very loyal to God. And um, Rabbi Sachs then says that's the word emuna, which literally is translated as faith, but. Uh, in biblical Hebrew, he says it really is better translated as faithfulness, reliability, and loyalty. It means not walking away from the other party when things are tough. So here he says there are people with great gifts, intellectual and uh, sometimes spiritual who fail to achieve what they might have done, and they lack the basic moral qualities of integrity, honesty, humility, and above all, loyalty. So they're very gifted, they're very talented, but they do whatever they do brilliantly, but they often do the wrong thing. And that really is what life is all about, I think because everyone is talented. We all have our talents. The question is, do we use them for the good or do we use them for the bad? In other words, people who are uh, you know, capable of doing scams, they're, they're very, generally they're very smart people. But why do they need to scam? Why would they need to, uh, to, to make a... Uh, uh, scam when they could, uh, you know, earn an honest living. If they have such great brains, what are they using it for something negative? They should use it for, they could use it for something positive. And, you know, everyone is, has, is blessed with certain, certain talents. The question is, are we really utilizing those talents for uh, that? Are we really utilizing those talents for good things or for bad things? The Gemara mentions that if a person is born in a certain mazel, which means a certain month or uh, 
a certain uh, um, moment that there's a certain constel the, the, the certain constellation that uh, is uh, red is a mazel madim. So it says he should become a ritual slaughterer. He should slaughter animals because he has the tendency to like blood. He's going to be so. Now, he could either use that to become a murderer, could be the chief murderer, God forbid, or he could be, he could use it for a positive thing. Could have a, he could be the top shaykhat in the, uh, in the slaughterers. Uh, he, could, he, could have the, he could have the highest position there and do the most uh, slaughtering a day. And, uh, you know, he, he, he could be in charge. But it's, it's all about utilizing it, utilizing the talents you're blessed with. So uh, here we're reading about Bilam, and we read about all the great talents that he had, that he was in the same league as Moses, and of, of huge talent, great talent, um, great, I mean, th there were gifts given to him that he had prophecy and, and um, new sorcery better than anyone else, uh, at least better than Moses, and he yeah, he was uh, uh, the greatest, uh, you know, in the in the in the nations. And yet, what did he do with his? Uh, what did he do with his blessings? With his talents, he used them to in to 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 bring to bring curses to try to curse or to the Jewish people or to bring punishment to the Jewish people and to destroy. That's what it was all. That's what he used all of his great talents. In other words, he, he, he knew exactly when Hashem is angry. And what's he going to do with that? Hurt the Jewish people. Why? Because he's getting paid. So here you have someone who's a real, you know, a real politician. <laughs> he's uh, just there, you know, whatever he can make his money, uh, you know, he makes his money and he'll choose whatever is best, whatever people want, whatever they, they pay him more. That's what he does. I, I once mentioned that it says before Mashiach comes, it says the nation, the face of the nation will be the face, will be like the face of, of the dog. And what does that mean? Pnei hadar to pnei hakelev. The face of the nation is like the face of, of a dog. And what that means is the dog constantly walks in front of you, but so it looks like the dog is leading you. But really it's constantly looking back to see what you're going to do. And sometimes leaders, they're, you know, they pretend as if they're leading you, but really they're deciding whatever you'll accept. That's what they're deciding. So they're looking back constantly to see, oh, should I do? Okay, yeah, I'll do this. Yeah, that's what they people want. Okay, fine. Uh, you know, they don't choose what's ethical, what's moral. They choose what the voters want. You know, what, what are the voters going to do? And, and whether it's right or wrong, Whatever the you know whatever's better for their votes, and well you know that that's what they'll do. Their friends, what their friends think is what their friends want. But this is utilizing all the blessings that one has, and and um, and just selling them for cheap. That's what it is. You're just selling it for money, selling all of your ethics just for some just for cash. That's what it is. Selling yourself, selling your soul. That's what he did. He sold his soul. And uh, Rabbi Sachs continues. And he says, so this is all about loyalty. And um, many people lack the basic moral qualities of integrity, honesty, humility, and above all, loyalty. What they do, they do brilliantly. But often they do the wrong things and they're conscious, conscious of their unusual endowments and they tend to look down on others instead of helping others with what they're blessed with they use it to look down on others and uh, they give way to pride arrogance and the belief that they can somehow get away with great crimes. And he says, Bilam is the classic example in the fact 
that he planned to entice the Israelites into sin even after he knew that God was on their side. How could he have done such a thing? What got into him? He knew that God didn't want it. So what was he thinking? So Rabbi Sachs says, this is a measure of how the greatest can sometimes fall to become the lowest of the low. But he doesn't really answer the question. How could he have done such a thing? How does the greatest fall to become the low of the low? How, how, what was he thinking? What was, and the, there is a verse in the Torah that says, Hashoichad ya'aver. It says, uh, bribery blinds people. And money sometimes blinds people. You simply become blinded. That's what happens. It, it, either it's for the sake of honor or desire or jealousy. All these things, they have the ability to make people do crazy things. And uh, it, it simply blinds you. You're blinded. You simply make the wrong choices. You make foolish choices because your mind is, is you're not, you, your mind is, is not sincere. It'll ultimately come out. Everything comes out some. It'll show itself. If your goal, if your desire is not 100% pure, it somehow presents itself in different areas. And what that means is, what the, what the verse says, it blinds you. Simple, simply you'll be blinded in certain scenarios. And so Rabbi Sachs concludes... He says, those who are loyal to other people find that other people are loyal to them. And those who are disloyal are eventually distrusted and lose whatever authority they might once have had. Leadership without loyalty is not leadership. Skills alone cannot substitute for the moral qualities that make people follow those who demonstrate them. We follow those we trust because they have acted so as to earn our trust. And he says that's why Moses was the great leader and Bilaam did not actually become. Always be lo loyal to the people you lead. And, um, you know, this is, this is a, a very interesting idea that what is a real leader? A real leader is someone, at least in the Jewish, I mean, I don't know if everyone is aware of this. You know, we think of rabbis. What is, what, what is the job of the chief rabbi, of a, of a great rabbi? The real job is that he's supposed to be a lawyer. That's really his job. He's supposed to be a lawyer. What do, what do I mean? He's supposed to fight the case of the Jewish people to God, before God. He is, the, he is the advocate for the Jewish people. That's what, a, that's what the chief rabbi is meant to be, the, the head rabbi, the head leader, Moses. And that's what Bilaam should have been. He should have fought for what's right, should have fought for humanity, for, you know, he was the leader of the nations, should have fought for what's, what's beneficial instead of hurting others, instead of destroying and, um, and that's really the job of a leader. You know, we think of it as, oh, he's supposed to be the most scholarly. It's not exactly true, most scholarly. Of course, Moses was, a, obviously, he got the Torah at Sinai. But that's not, that's not exactly, you know, if you think about what the, the, the main idea of a leader is his, his ability to save the Jewish people, to bring up, elevate the Jewish people, and to help our case, to fight our case in front of God. That's really what a what a leader is meant to be. And that's what Moses was. And that's this idea of loyalty that Rabbi Sachs sees as the contrast of Bilaam versus Moses. And something interesting that's brought in uh, uh, Kabbalistic books is that there's always a, a, a balance. Whenever someone great is born to the Jewish people, somehow there has to be some reason that the nations will allow it 
And either because we give them someone in the same league or somehow um, this great person has some flaws. And uh, this idea we find also with, with Mashiach. Mashiach's birth is a continuous, in other words, the, the, the ability to bring Mashiach is the, the, every, every episode in the history and the lineage of Mashiach is filled with issues and questionable flaws into his lineage, to, to his uh, um, legitimacy. And the reason why is because the, the, the powers of impurity would never allow for Mashiach to be born, only because there are so many flaws. What do I mean, the flaws? Well, the initial birth, the great-great-grandfather of Mashiach is, or start with King David's great-great-grandfather, is Judah and Tamar. That relationship, it looked like Tamar was uh, pregnant from a uh, inappropriate relationship. So that's how that began. And then came another relationship later on with the story of King David's uh, uh, grandmother, Ruth, who was questionable if she's allowed to marry into, uh, into the Jewish people. So she has a relationship with Boaz, but the question is, is she really legitimate? Is she a legitimate Jew? Because she's from Moab. And then you have the story of King David himself. He was born when his parents were separated. And so the question is, was King David legitimate? So each of these stories are continuous episodes that question the legitimacy of, uh, of, in the, 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 uh, of, the, uh, of the offspring of that's ultimately going to be going to be Mashiach's uh, Mashiach himself, or Mashiach's grandparents and great grandparents, and um, and the reason the reason why is because it it's not easy for um, to to get the agreement to allow such a holy soul to be born to the Jewish people. Not easy to get that get that okay, and I I believe that's why there were many great leaders like Maimonides, who had many rabbis that were very against them. Why? Because in order to allow their soul to be born, uh, the only way it would have was accepted was if there would be also great rabbis that would be very against them and fight, fight, fight against them and tell them that everything that they're doing is wrong. And only because of that were they allowed to, was their soul able to, um, to come down on earth and not be prevented, not and not be held up. And so this uh, this idea, I bring that because we have the story here of Moshe, and we have the story of Bilam. And Rabbi Sachs is putting a contrast between uh, comparing these two great people, Lahavdil, of course. That you have Moses, uh, who's the greatest of the great, and you have Bilam, who was very talented, but. Lahavdil Bilam, who was very talented, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, if the ability for Moses' soul to be born was the, uh, was the fact that there would be a Bilam, uh, that the fact that Bilam was born to the opposite side, maybe that helped uh, to allow the soul of Moses to be born to the Jewish people. Just a little thought there. But uh, in any event, the idea, the point that Rabbi Sachs is making is a um, is a very interesting idea that he brings about the uh, the fact that that Bilam had he was a free agent that wasn't loyal to any nation. He basically followed whoever paid him more, and I think the greatest I I, I think you see that from the fact that Bilam initially was hired by Sichon against Moab. To win, to win uh, Cheshbon, the city of Cheshbon. And then who hires him? Moab hires Bilam to fight the Jewish people. So he's really a free agent. Who's he fighting for? Fights for whoever pays him. And, uh, and it's not, it doesn't depend on what's right or what's wrong. It all boils down to, 
you know, whoever is, uh, whoever is hiring him. And, and that is uh, the, the issue with, with, uh, with uh, leadership that Rabbi Sachs says you can apply this into um, when it comes to hiring a leader, um, does it make a difference if the person has, uh, is, is a good person or a bad person, or do you just care about their policies? In other words, should we really look when it comes to leadership, when we vote someone in, should we look into uh, if they are, um, you know, what type of person they are in their personal life, or should we just look to their policies? Listen, if they're a Democrat, then we like them. If they're this, or if they're, you know, who, whatever side you're on, you know, you, you, you choose, or do you look into their personal life? Do you say, you know, the, that, uh, I, you know, let, let's see what, who, what type of person they are. There's a lot of people who just choose whatever, whatever uh, group they're part of. They don't care what type, of, what type of person the person is, as long as they're from their, their group. But, you know, maybe that's not right. Now, the problem, really, I don't know if Rabbi Sachs's advice is, is really uh, so applicable, because many times we have uh, leaders that they're all the same. In their personal life, no one wants to be uh, uh, like any of them. And so you don't have much of a choice. Sometimes you don't have a choice uh, to, to say, well, uh, this is a bad person, this is a good person, uh, you know, maybe we should choose this person, he's more loyal, because they're all maybe they're all bad people, but uh, we, now we just look at their policies. So you, you know you have to um, you know you have to understand that I don't know you know it's, it's very good and academically to discuss this, but I don't know how practical it is. Yes, uh, David. Sometimes you have a bad a person who is bad, but he happens to be the one that's saying the true stuff or the good right. stuff. Yeah, and listen, the guy who's expressing no the, the, you know what I'm saying, the, the people that are nice may be saying bad stuff. Right. Now, there's no question that this is an issue. It's, uh, this is the thing. I mean, uh, you know, it's hard to find people that are good through and through. You know, we, we, don't, uh, we don't have such people. So, uh, you know, you pick the policies, you pick the, what the person is, his, uh, his ideals. I mean, what, what do you, you know, what do you, what do you choose? Yeah, it's a, it's a huge uh, issue. I'm, I'm surprised no one wants to talk. Rabbi. I this would be the greatest. Uh... Rabbi, it is. It is. I, I think that, I don't know about how the others feel, but I personally feel very saddened to know that there appears to be some form of balance required. I don't know whether Hashem HaGadosh who requires it or what it is that seems to, according to what you're telling me, need, need according to Hazal say, that needs to be the, the evil forces, that it's not permitting the good enough one to be born unless there's a, a balancing bad force. And I don't understand why that is the case. What is the reason, maybe even Kabbalistically, why this is required? Well, well, it has to do with a balance. Uh, it has to do with uh, with not with being fair to everyone. That's what it boils down to. It's like a, a fear. In, that, in other words, the angels have to. It has to be accepted. That there's a there's a there's a judgment uh, that everything has to go through, and uh, that judgment deals with angels that are opposing and uh, angels that are uh, that are uh, advocates. You know, we have. Uh, and it has to be okay. Things have to be okay. That's the way it's 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 going. It goes through a legal system. You mean like the Sitra Achra has to have people on their side be allowed? That's the way God made the world. There has to be free choice in the world. There has to be. Uh, there has to be. Uh, Senegals and Ketigals. What, what did you say? Senegals and Ketigals. There is angels that can redeem and angels that, that are senate. You know, the, yeah, somebody has to tell the positive side of you and somebody has to do, show the negative side of you when you are in court. There's maiminim and masmi'ilim, the righty, the right side and the left side. There are right side angels and left side angels. And, uh, that's the way it works in, in the heavenly court. There's a bezdin shel maila. And... Uh, so it's not easy to get a get a holy soul down here on earth. There's a lot of opposition. 
there's, a, there's opposition that, that happens before a soul is allowed to come down to earth. That's why uh, there's labor pain. So that's why it takes so long. There's, a, there's opposition going on. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. That's my own little thought. That's why labor pain. But, uh, okay. Any other thoughts? Come on, I thought this was a great uh, political discussion. I thought it would uh, it would uh, open up. Uh, the, yes, think, David. Oh. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Ben. I didn't mean to cut you off. Ben? No, no, go let, ahead. let Ben go because I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> no, I wanted to say that the reason that the reason Bilan was successful with his trick of having the women, you know, enticed the, the Jewish men was because all the nations in Israel were less moral than us. And to them, to send the, the women out to, to entice the men is no problem. We wouldn't do it. We wouldn't try to use our women to entice them. So for them, it was easy. That's why Bilam could, could tell them to do it and they did it right away, no problem. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, of course, we would never do such a thing, such a lowly act. Right, right. Uh, okay, yeah. Yes, David. Yeah, I was going to say that um, I heard Rabbi Gordon the other day on Chabad.org on the Parsha, and he said one thing that's very um, significant. He said that everything that happens to a person and to everybody is Hashkacha Pratis, it's individual divine providence. And only one thing is not. What's that? The person's reaction. So that, you know, whatever happens to the person, it happens. And at the same time, the person has free choice and he has the ability to react one way or the other. Right. The other thing is why these things happen. It's it, one of the things that said is we're seeing a, sn a snippet of a situation in time. And we don't know what took place before, what took place after regarding past lives or, or future things, what's going to happen, what's going to be, because we're only looking at a small piece. And Hashem mm -hmm. says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. So if a person can try to delve into it in a positive way to see what's going on, but if a person has a complaint and says, well, why is this going on? I mean, it's, you know, the Rebbe Yitzhak, a British have complained and said, why is this going on? But at the same time, we have to understand that we're not going to understand Hashem's doing things for a particular reason. And uh, I, 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 there's a story real fast about these three uh, uh, Tanayim or Amarayim. And one said, uh, if I was Hashem, I would have done it this way. And the second one says, well, I, if, I, if I was Hashem, I would have done it a different way. I've done it this way. And the third one says, if I was Hashem, I would have done it exactly like Hashem did it. And I would understand why I did it that way. Uh -huh. That's, that's uh -huh. all. Right, right. I, are you specifically connecting that to the Parsha or just a, uh, an interesting part or to this discussion? Yeah, to this, dis to this discussion. To this discussion of, of the way Hashem has soul, certain souls come down to earth. Okay. Right, and also to what Phyllis was saying, why are things happening like this? Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Why is Hashem allowing the Eight Sahara right. or the Satan uh -huh. to do bad stuff? Right. We're, right. Only, we're only seeing a picture, a, a, a snippet. Right. And, and right. within that snippet, we got to do what we got to do. Shkaya, yeah, very nice, very nice. Okay, the any question other... Is uh, yes. Yes, Phyllis. Phyllis? Yes. Um, I, I Well, I basically was trying to understand how we can know what is the best way in terms of our having the most positive reaction so as to elicit derech kavana and derech our, our, our best intentions so that we can operate in accordance with haratzon shel Hashem HaGadosh Baruch Hu. So, so that we can elicit the most favorable reaction and not empower the sitwa. By studying Tanya, you'll know. It can only be bad. Right. 
Well, basically, you know, what the, the way it works is every person has certain energy that we're given. We have energy that we are given. And when we waste that energy, guess who gets it? The opposite side, the sitra achra, the other side, the side of impurity. So every time we have, we waste our day, we waste our time, we waste our energies, we, we you know, and our, our, our abilities, we, wait, we just waste them and, and do nothing with them. So all of that energy gets, gets used, gets now taken by the opposite side, and they can now, uh, uh, they, they sort of live on our, like, uh, it's like bacteria, living on our, uh, eating away at our, from, from, from what we left over, our leftovers. And so we have to try to make sure to utilize everything that we're blessed with for positive purposes so that there's nothing left for the opposite side to be able to have any sustenance and to be able to live, to, you know, to, to live. It's like fungus living. We're, we're allowing the fungus, we're feeding the fungus and the bacteria to live. And instead, what we should be doing is withholding any energy from it and trying to starve it. That's what we're supposed to do, starve the sitra achra from, from its abilities. And if we would do that, it would have no power. So that is really the, the, the secret of, 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 of uh, you know, getting rid of this, uh, any negative, uh, any sitra achra, any uh, powers, outside powers, is if we just starve them. We have to starve them mm -hmm. to death. And that's by us using everything that we have for Hashem, for his purposes. Of course, you have to, to, to it, it, it's something that uh, doesn't uh, come easy. It uh, means we constantly have to think of Hashem in everything that we do. Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Summit. We should have Hashem in front of, in front of our eyes always. And when we are eating, we're sleeping, we're drinking, we're, we're, you know, going to sleep, uh, you know, we're reading, whatever we're doing, we're thinking that we're doing this for Hashem. And everything that, you know, by, by doing that and, and by not wasting our energy and even our, you know, talent, our, our hobbies of playing music or uh, whatever it is, it's, it's for a good purpose. And by doing that, we are making sure that we're not feeding the, the, uh, the fungus of the citra achra, the, the opposite side. Okay, any other last, any last thoughts? I can, I can, you have a chance. Come on. Right. Rabbi? Right. Yes. God. Ask it. Question. I, can't wait, ask so I apologize. Why is the parasha called Balak instead of Bilam? Uh huh. Yeah, why? That's why so is the parasha called Balak instead of Bilam? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'll just tell you a little vart. <laughs> There was a big Rav who was very big in Avas Yisrael. He loved any, any, any idea that, about, that spoke about Avas Yisrael. He was, uh, I think he was the Apter Rav. He loved uh, anything about Avas Yisrael he would, he would do anything for. And uh, he loved every single year that he really was uh, uh, totally given over to anything that he could uh, help out another year. And so uh, he says, do you think if you look at the Parsha, even the name of the Parsha is V'yahavta l'reacha kamaycha, Balak. Beis, beis, v'yahavta, lamed l'reacha. In the chaf, the, the kuf is kamaycha. So they asked him, they said, you know, you're, you're spelling it totally wrong. You know, Balak is a base, it's not a vav. And the uh, kamaycha is a kaf, not a kuf. You, what are you talking about? We have to, it's a hint for we have to kamaycha. He said, just because it's a different letter, you're going to ruin the Avas Yisrael just because you uh, changed the letter. So anyway, just a little part of, uh, of the yeah. idea Great. that it says. Rabbi, my, my son has a question. Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, Rabbi Smith, I... I... <clears throat> Um, uh, I just, uh, I, I listen on my parents' share once in a while, but I, I have a question on this topic. Yeah. Um, it, I heard there was a source. I'm not, I'm not sure which source I, 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 I heard this, but I, 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 I was, I was told that Hashem make when, when there's a, um, a poison or, or some sort of detriment 
created in life, the, 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 there's always a, a, a cure made beforehand. Even if it's not found yet, there's a cure made beforehand. Right. Right. So it, it, it is, is, is it, when Hashem, when Hashem made the Torah and 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 and, and, and gave it at, uh, at Har Sinai, did 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 he say that every impediment that life gives will will have a remedy that can be resolved for it? Is that is that is that what the what the source dictates? That that any did you say that any sickness there's a remedy for? It says Hashem makes the cure before he makes the sickness. Right. That's what I heard. Okay. So yeah, that's is that correct. Accurate? Is that inaccurate? That's accurate. Right. Yeah. Okay. And it says that Hashem brings the cure before the sickness. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay, um, everyone. Um, I can say about the rabbi that you talked about, he could have answered if God can change a curse to a blessing. Why shouldn't I change a bet kuf to a to a vav chav? Good. Okay, very nice, very nice, uh, Rabbi Smith. Yes. Before you sign off, I wanted yes. to know. Uh, I don't know if you have two minutes, but there's this amazing story that I just read yesterday on Shabbos from from a Parshas Chukas in Rabbi Zevin Sefer about. The Ohev Yisrael, this rabbi that you're talking about, Rabbi Avram Yeshua Heschel of Apta. And just I'll squinch it up, but basically he passed away on the 5th of Nisan in 1829. And on the same night in the holy city of Tiberia, there was a knocking on the window of the uh, Shamas. And he was the only one that had the keys to the cemetery. And there was a voice from outside that said, go outside, go outside and follow the, the, uh, the coffin of the Rav of Abda. And he ventured outside. He was chilled with terror. The bear was, the, the, kever, the uh, coffin was being followed by a grim retinue of myriad human forms from the other world. One of these followers intimated to him that this was the funeral procession of the Tzaddik of Abda. He had passed away in Medzibush, and angels from above had brought his coffin here for entombment in the soil of the Holy Land in Tiveria. The shamas repeated the story in the morning. The people refused to believe him until the suggestion of an elderly sage. They went together to the cemetery where they found a newly covered grave. Letters from Abda later confirmed that the tzaddik had indeed passed away on that very day. And before his passing, he had cried out to heaven about the, uh, the bitter, uh, bitter protest about the length of Golos. Why was the Mashiach taking so long? And in his heartache, he wept and said, before Rabbi Levi Yitzchak Radichev left this world, he promised that he would not rest, nor allow the tzaddik in the other, in, nor the tzaddikim in the world of truth to rest, until their insistence, please, would bring them about the messianic redemption. But when he arrived there, the saintly souls in the Garden of Eden found spiritual plight in his company and ascended with him to the palaces of supernal bliss until he forgot his own promise, but I will not forget. Right. So, uh, and then the follow-up is where in 1930 when Reb, uh, Reb, the Munka Chereba, uh went to visit the holy sites in Eretz Israel, he asked among the older citizens of Tiveria as to where any of them knew that the Rav of Apta was buried and they uh -huh. led him to a certain stone slab in the old cemetery that the elders were now, uh, they, the, their elders were now in the world. The truth had shown them in the place where the Oavius Rail had been brought to rest. He had been transported by, from Mezebush to uh -huh. Tiveria by angels. Wow, very interesting story. I just wanted to uh, mention to Isaac. So Isaac asked, why is the parsha called Balak and not Bilam? So I, th I think... Um, it's brought down. The, the, the question is asked. It's not my own answers. One of the answers uh, that, that's mentioned is that Balak is the uh, ancestor of Mashiach. And uh, because Balak's uh, grandchild is Rus. And Balak also initiated the whole thing. In other words, Balak initiated the whole thing. Bilam was really just a... a, 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 a he he came after 
it was a continuation of, but Balak was the one who instigated and started the whole thing. And also Balak, it says, hated the Jewish people more than Bilo even. And because of that, the, this was a true ishapcha, true uh, turnover of from Balak's total hatred to the, to the blessings that we have in Parsha. So all, mm-hmm. because of all of the above, it comes out that, uh, that, that the Parsha is better named Balak than, than Bilo. Okay. Anyway, Zai Guzant, everyone. Have a wonderful day, evening, and we'll see you tomorrow, Mr. Shem. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi.